we continue, okay, missed this is something, uh, symbolism, <laughs> where um, we make, always make progress, right, on page 66, uh -huh. that would be a miracle if they read the whole book. <laughs> hmm. You think, dear, we should have one hour reading? They're too long anyway. Everything is too long today. Meister Eckhart has the same idea of the inexorable falling love. Impossible to escape. Oh, it's impossible to escape. Expressed under less personal images. Earth, he says, cannot escape the sky. Let it flee up or down, the sky flows into it and makes it fruitful, whether it will or not. What God does to man, he who will escape him only runs to his besom, for all corners are open to him. There's no escape, in other words. Hmm. We find in all the mystics the strange sense of a mysterious spiritual life, a reality over against man, seeking him and compelling him to its will. It is not for him, they think, to say that he will or will not aspire to the transcendental world. Hence, sometimes this inversion of man's long quest of God. The self resists the pull of spirits of gravitation. Please from the touch of eternity, and the eternal seeks it, tracks it ruthlessly down. The following love, capital following love, the mystics say, is a the following love. The mystics say is a fact of experience, not a poetic idea. Those strong feet that follow, follow after once set upon the chase, are bound to win. Man, once conscious of reality, cannot evade it. For a time, his separated spirit has disordered loves. They will fully frustrate the scheme of things, but he must be conquered in the end. Then the mystic process unfolds itself. Love triumphs. The purpose of the world's fulfills itself in the individual life. Uh -huh. So that was section one of symbolism part. Was that the journeying part? Number two, it was natural and inevitable that the imagery of human love and marriage should have seemed to the mystic the best of all images of his own fulfillment of life. His soul surrender, first to call, finally to embrace the perfect love. Well, we finish section one, which is the journeying path, etc. Now we have the initial marriage of the soul to God. It lay ready to his hand. It was understood of all men, and moreover, it certainly does offer upon lower levels a strangely exact parallel to the sequence of states in which man's spiritual consciousness unfolds itself and which form the consummation of the mystic life. It has been said that the constant use of such imagery by Christian mystics of the medieval period is traceable to the popularity of the Song of Songs, regarded as an allegory of the spiritual life. I think that the truth lies rather in the opposite statement, namely that the mystic loves the Song of Songs because he there saw reflected as in a mirror the most secret experiences of his soul. 
the sense of a desire that was insatiable, of a personal fellowship so real, inward and intense, that it could only be compared with the closest link of human love, of an intercourse that was not mere spiritual self-indulgence, but was rooted in the primal duties and necessities of life, rather those deepest, most intimate secrets of communion, those self-giving ecstasies which all mystics know, but of which we, who are not mystics, may not speak. All these he found symbolized and suggested there, underable glories veiled in a merciful mist in the poetry which man has invented to honor that august passion in which the merely human draws nearest to the divine. This is like poetry, huh? Is this like prose poetry? <laughs> what do you think? Mm -hmm. The great saints who adopted and elaborated this symbolism, applying it to their pure and ardent passion for the absolute, were destitute of the purient imagination which their modern commentators too often possessed, they were essentially pure of heart. And when they saw God, they were so far from the confusion, from confusing that earthly vision with the products of morbid sexuality, that the dangerous nature of the imagery which they employed did not occur to them. They knew by experience the unique nature of spiritual worlds. But no one can know anything about it in any other way. Thus, for St. Bernard, uh, throughout his deeply mystical sermons on the Song of Songs, the Song of Songs, dear, is that Psalms <laughs> from the Bible, like David, uh, the divine word is the bridegroom. The soul is the bride, which, but how different is the effect produced by his use of these symbols from that with which he has been charged by Astokirik. In the place of that sensuous imagery which is so often and so earnestly deplored by those who have hardly a modern acquaintance with the writings of the saints, who find images which indeed have once been sensuous, but which are here anointed and adorned to a holy office, carried up and transmuted and endowed with a radiant purity and intense spiritual light. Let him kiss me with the kisses of his mouth. Who is it speaks these words? It is the bride. Who is the bride? It is the soul thirsting for God. She who asks this is held by the bond of love to him from whom she asked it. Of all the sentiments of nature, this of love is the most excellent, especially when it is rendered back to him who is the principle and the fountain of it. That is God. Nor are there found any expressions which will seek to signify that mutual affection between the word of God and the soul. Do you think the soul, while listening to the music of the spirits, could be in love with the sound? Hmm. Hmm. Well, you could take an act, you could get an appetite for sound as those of bridegroom and bride and so much as between the individuals who stand in such relation to each other all things are in common and they possess nothing separate or divided they have one inheritance one dwelling place one table and they are in fact one flesh if then mutual love is essentially befitting to a bride and bridegroom it is not unfitting that the name of bride is given to a soul which loves. Mm -hmm. We're talking about symbolism after all. Can you think of any other better, better symbols? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. 
you're not able to. So you thought of the path of going on this long trip through the pilgrim's progress on Dante's Divine Comedy. Or else we can write about the marriage of the soul. Hmm. Two women mystics of the Catholic Church, familiar with the antique and poetic metaphor, which called every chartered, cloistered nun the Bride of Christ. That crisis in their spiritual history in which they definitely vowed themselves to the service of the transcendental reality seemed natural enough the veritable betrothal of the soul, often in a dynamic vision they saw as in a picture the binding vows exchanged between their spirits and their God. That further progress on the mystic way which brought in it brought with it a sharp and permanent consciousness of union with the divine will, the constant sustaining presence of a divine companion beca became by an extension the original simile spiritual marriage. The element of elements of duty, constancy, irrevocable irrevocable irrevocableness and the loving obedience involved in the medieval conception of the marriage tie made it an apt image of a spiritual state in which humanity in which humility intimacy and love were the dominant characteristics there is really no need to seek a pathological explanation of these simple facts Moreover, with few exceptions, the descriptions of spiritual marriage which the great mystics have left are singularly free from the physical imagery. Quote, so mysterious is the secret, says St. Teresa. Quote, and so sublime the favor that God thus bestows instantaneously on the soul that it feels a supreme delight only to be described by saying that our Lord vouchsafes for the moment to reveal to it his own heavenly glory in a far more subtle way than by any vision or spiritual delight. As far as can be understood, the soul, <coughs> I mean the spirit of his soul, is made one with God who is himself a spirit and who has been pleased to show certain persons how far his love for us extends in order that we may praise his greatness. He has thus deigned to unite himself <coughs> to his creature. He has bound himself to her as firmly as two human beings are joined in wedlock and will never separate himself from her. I'm talking about symbol type number two. And mysticism and symbolism of uh, mysticism by Evelyn Underhill. So it's like getting married, I guess. <laughs> do you do you like the path method or the sim marriage method, or do you just like to mix them all up? <laughs> Is your soul married to God or are you on a journey to God? <laughs> <laughs>